Greetings, and welcome to realizing the full value of your EHR with the digital health ecosystem. And hey, folks, thanks for making the time to, to wheel over here from the, the keynote. That's, it's quite a hike, but I sure do appreciate you uh, making the time to, to spend with us. Now, uh, this is a healthcare topic. Just want to make sure everybody's aligned on that. We're going to be featuring electronic health records, or EHRs, and their integrated applications running on AWS. And today, we're going to really try to accomplish five things. One, frame up how the cloud is helping healthcare innovation today. Define what we mean by a digital health ecosystem. And then we're, we're going to hear from one of your peers and about their digital health ecosystem journey and where they're creating value using the AWS cloud and how they're enhancing the provider and patient experience. So I'm Mike Hedgie. I'm with Amazon Web Services. I'm an EHR leader at AWS Healthcare. And many of us have compelling reasons why we're in healthcare. Audrey Helen Sutherland is my reason why. Now, she was born in Aberdeen, Scotland on June 12, 1940. But unfortunately, at the age of 37, her care team detected a lump in her breast. Further tests revealed that the cancer had spread to her other organs. Audrey succumbed to cancer on March 31, 1978, less than 30 days after detection. Now, she never got to see any of her four children graduate high school, university, fall in love, get married. And she never got to hold any of her grandchildren, including my two. I was Audrey's eldest son. Now, a lot of healthcare innovation has happened since 1978. First of all, we have EHRs. EHR best practice alerts could have alerted her care team to schedule mammograms earlier. And cancer screening against, uh, or genetic screening against uh, cancer signatures might have been able to assess a higher risk score and changed her care treatment. So perhaps some of these preventative care measures might have allowed Audrey to survive a lot longer than the 30 days that she had. So Audrey Helen Sutherland is my reason why I'm in healthcare. And that intersection between health and technology is why I'm at AWS. So why am I talking about EHRs? About 30 years ago, I joined this tiny little software development company in Madison, Wisconsin, increasing their staff count up to 30. That company was Epic, and today Epic is a leader in electronic health records. Uh, I was their technical fellow. I worked with health systems to try to find simpler ways to deploy and operate their EHR. My career at Epic lasted a little under 30 years. Uh, by 2020, Epic, Epic had grown from 30 to 10,000, and I retired to Montana from Epic in early 2021. I started hauling around photographic gear for my beautiful and talented wildlife photographer wife. Um, now, she's fascinated by large mammals, especially grizzly bears. And we had some great adventures. Um, and while she uses a strong telephoto lens, you still get pretty close. That whirring sound that you hear is her high-end camera clicking away. I'm just using an iPhone to take this. So it turns out retirement's pretty dangerous. And uh, I, I miss the mission. So I'm continuing it here at Amazon. And while I worked at Epic, I now work at AWS, make that perfectly clear. And uh, uh, a lot of the topics that we're going to be talking about today are really applicable to many EHRs that are out there. Easier to deploy and operate. That really speaks to IT efficiency, IT effectiveness. But that's not really the goal that we're trying to do in healthcare. That's not really our mission. What we're trying to do is get and keep our population healthy. And to do that, we have to find ways to make our caregivers more efficient, more effective. 
IT effectiveness and technology really is in support of these greater objectives. For context, let's go back to 1992. This is what the AHR looked like back then. You know, it was really just a digital representation of a paper chart. And it was pretty simple for IT to deploy and operate. You had a big server in the data center. You had serial networks with maybe banks of modems. And you had a whole bunch of inexpensive video display terminals. Now, physicians, they would sometimes look up information in these systems, but they would rarely enter data into it. Their workflow was more along the lines of office visit, dictate into a recording device, give this recording device to a transcriptionist who would then enter it into the system. It wasn't really a joy to use for clinicians. And EHR vendors thought that they could do better, so they built graphical user interfaces in front of these EHRs. And now a physician could view data visually. There was pathways and flow charts and growth charts, and you could annotate on images. And yes, you could still dictate into the system. But now there were documentation tools to make it a little bit easier. And physicians started using it a bit more. And it created a better clinician experience. However, it did create some IT challenges. All these $300 terminals needed to be replaced with $3,000 personal computers with high resolution monitors, a keyboard, and a mouse. And then how do you get the software out there? And how do you get it updated? Now, how many here folks uh, recall the, uh, the storage acronym RAID? A redundant array of inexpensive disks? Well, back in the day when we were rolling out a release, we <laughs> kind of joked that we employed a redundant array of inexpensive interns. Now, my son and my daughter, they got involved. You know, I'd give them floppy disks, they'd run around to the PCs, they'd type in install.bat. And, you know, for a small ambulatory clinic of maybe 30 to 50 uh, workstations, yeah, you, could, you could roll out an upgrade in a, on a Saturday. But for larger health systems that have tens of thousands of workstations, that just didn't scale. And so technology companies started implementing things to ease that IT challenge. Now, it started off with software deployment systems like Novell Zenworks and Microsoft SMS. And then it was virtual applications or application virtualization, Citrix, or desktop virtualization, VMware. And then it came to mobile applications. Well, now we have to manage that. So mobile device management, MDMs. And now web applications. Well, we have to make sure it's all secure. So we've got web application firewalls and all sorts of things to make it easier for IT to implement these things that improve that, that uh, clinician efficiency. But my point really is that we're experiencing a virtuous cycle with the EHR. It starts with EHRs producing new features to improve the clinician experience. And sometimes that creates IT challenges, not always, but sometimes it creates IT challenges that then technology vendors deliver a solution to. Now, healthcare IT sees these solutions sometimes as being risky and a little difficult to deploy and provision and, and operate, and, and they uh, cutting edge technology or bleeding edge technology, they, they're often called. And they want to spend a year or two to get comfortable with that new technology before they trust their EHR with it. Now, this cycle, it not, it not only repeats, its frequency is accelerating. And the speed to make our clinicians and caregivers more effective can't wait for IT to get comfortable with it for a year or two. So I propose that we need to change how we think about the EHR, especially in IT. The EHR, the Electronic Health Record. When I think of electronic, I think of static, you know, static electricity. And health records are not static. They grow. They grow with new features. They grow with new applications, government regulations, 
mergers and acquisitions, new clinical relationships. It's not uncommon for an EHR to grow 20% year over year. That doubles every three and a half years. So I pr propose that we need an elastic health record to expand with that growth. One that leverages elastic compute, elastic storage, elastic networking. One that grows ahead of the pace that we grow. Running your EHR on AWS transforms it into an elastic health record. And let's face it, that health record is not just the EHR. The digital health ecosystem includes the EHR. It includes radiology imaging systems, PAC systems, document management systems. And chances are, if you've been using EHRs for a while and you've switched EHRs, you still have a whole bunch of valuable medical history that you have stored in, in archives. Coding systems, lab systems, blood banks, and then interface engines that glue it all together. We have the opportunity to give our entire digital health ecosystem the same attention that we traditionally give to the EHR. We can make them fast, reliable, and secure. We can make them elastic as well by running them in AWS. And the cool thing is, when you put your digital health ecosystem in the AWS cloud, you're putting it where that cutting edge technology already exists, where it's already been proven by your peers in healthcare, but also other industries, finance, banking, government, even the military. This reduces the risk and increases the speed that this new technology can be employed so that we can make our caregivers more effective. But you don't have to take my word for it. This is no longer the art of the possible. Your peers are already doing it. Uh, Tufts Medicine consolidated six EHRs into one. Just happened to be Epic. And they implemented Epic and 42 applications that integrate with, with Epic into AWS. And they did it in 14 months. It typically takes 18 to 24 months to implement a, uh, an EHR. So that's, that's incredibly fast. Dr. Shafiq Rob, who happens to be sitting in the audience up here, is creating a frictionless care environment for patients, physicians, and really the entire care team by migrating their digital health ecosystem to AWS. And he says that it enables them to integrate data-driven intelligence into everyday health and care that is more secure, resilient, and simple to use. Now, they've been live since April, and uh, you know this is a 200-level session, so we thought that you'd want to hear from somebody who's done it and who could go deep. Uh, this Jeremy Marut, he's uh, Tufts Medicine's Chief of Digital Modernization. Now, he's very well known in the Epic community, but two things really stand out. First, he's somebody who's willing to take a leap. Jeremy has the, this unique talent of detecting where health is going and where technology is going, and he commits himself and his team fully to that direction. And second, secondly, he's known as somebody who gets things done. There's very little to deter Jeremy from moving forward with his commitments. So it's an honor to welcome Jeremy to the stage to explain Tufts Medicine's journey of bringing their digital health ecosystem to AWS. Here you go, sir. Thank you, Mike. That's a heck of an intro. And um, I mean, I'm humbled and I'm honored to be here. I'm honored that you all trekked your way here. Um, I couldn't believe <laughs> the amount of uh, time it took to get over here. So I'm very happy for, for you guys to be here. Um, I can't get over that intro, it was pretty good. I think in my 25 years, this is my best salary.com title, Chief of Digital Modernization for Tufts Medicine up in Boston. Um, thank you for coming to listen to my story. Uh, I'm very honored to be here once again, and I'm fortunate to be here because there's not a lot of organizations, there haven't been any organizations or leaders uh, before that had the stomach to take this leap and go all in. So I hope I could use this short time that we have together to share our story and our successes 
and explain that we have proven the concepts. That last slide was a little harsh, so, but we still have proven the concept. Like Mike said, we went live with our ecosystem on April 2nd this year. I love to use these notes, but I change my mind so much throughout the day that I rewrite them as we go. We're always asked, why did you go to the cloud? Why did you decide to go to the cloud for a health system? And I think our CEO, Mike Dandorf, put it best. He said, there are four million reasons that come to us at their most vulnerable. And there are 18,000 internal reasons that care for those four million when they need the care. Dr. Shafiq Rab, our Chief Digital Officer and CIO, and I began this journey to cloud probably about five years ago, I lost count. We exhaustively went on a national search to all the big cloud providers, got the relationships at the highest levels. We stuck close to our mothership, Epic. We always wanna make sure we're lockstep with, with them. We've done Epic at uh, several organizations. We know a lot of folks at Epic, and we just wanna make sure that we're following their cloud strategy along the way. We selected AWS for a ton of good reasons that I'm happy to discuss or debate with you uh, after this or at any time. We had the fortune to join our CEO, Mike Dandorf, at Tufts when he recruited Dr. Rob to come run the digital transformation for a place that was very ripe for transformation, a burgeoning health system. We had to come and find a true north to bring everybody together and to modernize the entire organization. Bringing this ecosystem to the cloud was only a foundational step in the entire digital transformation. The guiding principles for this transformation was a frictionless experience, and that perfectly lined up with our vision to not just dip a toe in and not do another POC or not just do a portion of this, but bring that entire ecosystem of applications that creates the clinical experience along for the ride. The fact that the cloud finally had enough advances in compute, storage, speed, and scale, it gave us the confidence that it would be able to run a majority of these mission critical applications in the cloud. And finally, I'm gonna explain how our cloud center of excellence is actually doing excellence. And we achieved that through relationships, very strong relationships with our people and partners, very strong relationships with our patients, and maybe most importantly in this journey is very deep relationships with our third party vendors and creating a true collaboratory and a partnership to help bring them along with us. As you might have caught earlier, the actual implementation was just a short 14 months. We, now we did this without a partner. And that's one of the big reasons we selected AWS. Now, the, you, you've seen here, there's a massive partner ecosystem, tons of partners, and they're very supportive of them. But at the same time, they understood that to jumpstart this in healthcare, especially at health systems, they needed to put a little skin in the game and get a group together that was actually gonna figure out, hey, how are we gonna help customers do this? So, uh, with the help of a, a couple folks that actually supplemented our own staff and pro, their ProServe team. I got to shout out Kevin Vong, he's like a member of our family now. We consolidated six disparate inpatient EHRs, over 30 ambulatory EMRs, all into that full suite of Epic. We're about 1,000 beds throughout the system, 2,300 doctors, 1,800 staff members, all across inpatient, ambulatory uh, revenue cycle, as well as a pretty big home health uh, organization. As you saw earlier also, it was the Dr. Rob's vision to encapsulate this full portfolio of applications that create the experience and apply the benefits of cloud computing to integrate data-driven intelligence into the everyday health and care of our patients that's more secure it's more resilient, and it's being able to be used with no friction. So it's all about the ecosystem. 
the big companies like Epic, and especially Epic, they have your back. They're not gonna let their customers fail. But in terms of cloud, they've also got a massive investment in it, in time, in people, in architecture. So they've been working with the cloud vendors out there, and they know what is going to be able to run and what isn't. Um, we worked in a strong partnership with them as well to help move this thing along, but bottom line, they are not gonna let the, the, you, the customer, fail. That supporting cast of third-party vendors, it's a different story. They don't have an incentive to move to cloud. Like back in the day, they didn't have an incentive to go to VMs. They have no staff available, very, very worried that they cannot support you. In right? your worst time, when your medicine cabinet is down and they don't have a person that understands what an EC2 is, their, their immediate response is, no, we can't do it. We won't be able to support you. So we wanted a consistent, we wanted to bring all of these together because we wanted a consistent resiliency and latency across all the apps, essentially having them in the same data center and all moving in kind of like a bubble together to reduce any disruptions. We cloudified over 40 traditional monolithic applications, but we applied modern native tools and methodologies. We standardized, we codified, and we elasticized these applications. We used tools like AWS CloudFormation to codify everything and make sure that from the three weeks it took us to set up non-prod, it took us three hours to press the button and bring up production instance. We heavily use AWS CloudWatch. It enables us to build an AI operations uh, environment where we can predict when things are gonna go wrong. And again, as I said, the biggest part of my job is partnering with these third parties, educating them and incentivizing them so that they can get the confidence to know that it's okay it's gonna work, and they're gonna be able to support us. It's Vegas is very dry. Sorry. What's the value, cloud value, in health system operations? Well, first and foremost, improve, improved availability and resiliency. We consistently provide a unified experience for all our clinicians and patients. We've reduced costs. It's all on-demand consumption-based budgets. We literally monitor it, monitor it in real time, these budgets and this usage, and we can adjust it in real time too. Dynamic capacity. This was a huge one for me because of uh, big failures in the past. Never run out of space again. How many times are we forsaking patient care, forsaking the business, because we gotta understand what's available in our data center and what we can support. Never again will a breast center want to go and give the community free mammograms on a weekend and say, oh my God, I forgot to call the CTO, and all these patients lined up gotta go home because your storage is out. Never again. Never gonna forsake a patient. They're always gonna be there and they're always gonna get care. It's not gonna be your hardware sitting in a data center going out. And it always comes down to data, right? I am so jealous of all the stuff that's going on here because I've been so hyper-focused on infrastructure, but like Dr. Rob likes to call it, it's the liquid gold. Having this entire ecosystem in one modern environment it allows us to apply that modern AI and ML to this data to come up with that innovation that we're thinking should have happened already in healthcare. Now we've been talking about interoperability probably 15 years, maybe more, and we're still talking about it. So being able to have this all in one massive ecosystem, regardless of they could, if they can speak to each other, as long as we're, we have our data in one place and you've got the right tools to access it, you're taking it to another level. Ah, the beautiful golden architecture, my biggest mistake. 
in my exuberance and excitement that, you know, Dr. Rob and Mike signed the contracts. So, oh my God, I've been waiting to get going and get done. This is going to take care of itself. Don't worry. Convince a couple of vendors and we'll build it. We had no real reference architecture to start. We didn't sit down and take the time to design that golden architecture. And there are some systems that we rebuilt four times. And again, we still got it done in 14 months and we did it internally, but not having that really hurt us. And what I've come to really find now that I reflect on it, the big secret is you wanna build an architecture that nobody can achieve. That is gonna open up and expose everything that is lacking in healthcare IT systems today. What it did is open up a transparent dialogue between IT and operations and the vendor. For instance, in the architecture, uh, an application that can achieve it will be up in the biggest disaster in 15 minutes. But vendor A, their system, we know it's gonna take about six hours. This lets the operational department prepare and understand what that means and what the impact is to the actual hospital, as well as kind of a cycle puts pressure back on the vendor to say, hey, why do I have to use your device? Why don't I go to B, C, or D over here and get them since they'll be up in that 15 minutes and they're able to achieve it. And that was critical in opening up that partnership and coming into our collaboratory and showing that, hey, we're gonna get this done together. Promised a million times that we'd have a parallel on-prem running whenever you need it. Never did that, but I hope there's no vendors in this room that I haven't converted yet. Um, and I like to say we're 120 or something percent successful, because we went into this, I thought we'd have 30, and we're live on over 42 applications today. And we didn't fail on any of them. None of them had a failure. They all moved and we have none of their footprint on premises at all, other than some relay servers. What we did together with our operational partners is that we've entirely flipped the script. So in terms of a transformation of an organization, we've partnered together and we flipped it. And what that means is you're gonna dish out one, two, five, ten million dollars for a piece of software that's critical to your surgeon, this is the best one on the planet, and they're gonna come day one of kickoff, they being the vendor, and drop a thousand page manual on your desk and say, you need to support us in this way. Well, that doesn't happen anymore at Tufts. When we go and we look for a piece of software, we partner with our operational team, we let them know they're gonna get the software they want but it's really a team effort and you have to go into it with that backbone to say, we're not gonna buy your software unless you're gonna achieve this level of resiliency. And if not, we're gonna need a roadmap that will work together to get you there. And again, that has worked time and again. Uh, we have not opted back to on-premises with anything yet. And also I like to say, from talking to a lot of folks that are very worried about their staff, you wanna have an architecture, you wanna architect your training program. There's really three levels of training at least. You wanna train you know, your ninjas, your staff in those cloud technologies. You wanna train your vendor partners in those cloud technologies, but also in your operational uh, environment. And then there'll be cloud engineers that you go out and you pluck you know, you get a quarter million dollar top architect guy that has no, or gal that has no idea what it means uh, to transmit HL7. Um, so there's a little bit of a reverse training there. It's very important to put that together. Another favorite towel. These are all favorite. I could talk about this stuff all day. I got to try to keep it together here. Security, the tipping point. Uh, we're finally seeing now that we've, we've taken the plunge and been successful. You know, go back two years ago, you would go present to the board that, hey, we're going and taking our uh, EHR and we're putting it in the cloud. Taking all our patient data, we're going into AWS. Forget it, you're fired on the spot. Why did you even hire this guy? That's insane. 
Today, there's a couple drivers happening. One, Tufts went live. It's been pretty darn successful. There's monetary things you'll see later. Uh, but two, in the cyber arena, cyber insurance, especially for health systems, has gotten ridiculous. Not only the cost of it, but also the process to actually achieve it. Uh, we found that now being in the cloud and following a, f a specific framework, you're gonna get some free check boxes uh, in that uh, security assessment, and it's gonna be much easier for you to get in insured. Cloud exposes everything that we've obscured for years upon years upon yours. One of the banes of my existence in this whole thing is the fact that we have reports upon reports that our biggest, one of our biggest security threats is inside attacks. We found that over 40 of our, 40% 40 of our mission critical applications did not even have the simple capabilities of TLS encryption. So in our data center, and I guarantee in your data centers, you have at least 40% of your apps transmitting clear text patient data. It's happening today. So the answer that usually comes back is, well, it's in our data center, okay. And secondly is VPN, the wonderful VPN. Well, two things about VPN. On the one side, you're gonna be building very resilient, massive pipelines of communication between your on-premises data centers or closets out to the cloud, 10 gig, 100 gig fiber. That's extremely expensive, but very, very low latency and very high speed. What we found with all the top quadrant providers of VPN out there, the fastest throughput point to point, no matter how much we team, was brought that all the way down to two gig. So whatever size pipe you got, you're only gonna be running two gig through that VPN. Secondly, back to your golden architecture and your resilience and all the benefit we get from the automated failover, the unlimited capacity. Once you throw VPN in the mix, especially teaming VPNs, try to fail over automatically. I'm sure there's a couple ninjas that have figured it out with a billion lines of uh, automated actions. It's not simple. So to be able to bring you know, all those IPs over, to be able to actually have it happen without interruption, is near impossible, we found, with, with VPN. You're gonna wanna start with a clean slate. Instead of this lift and shift of all that technical debt that you've built over the years, I call it refinancing that debt into the cloud. It's not a great thing to do. Uh, you wanna start with a zero trust mindset, as, as difficult that is, as it is. Uh, you want to follow AWS's well-architected framework. Follow it to a T. No matter how much you're an expert in something, no matter how much you think you've got a better way to start, you got to follow it to a T. It helps the entire team come into one single mentality and mindset. We followed it, and it helped us achieve our first coal fire security review was astounding, a 4.8 out of 5. And they clearly said it's because of the fact that we line by line followed all those recommendations in that framework from AWS. And then you wanna build everything as code. I mean, that's one of the biggest benefits of cloud. So you wanna codify it all so that when you build all those rules and you build that security in and you pop that up in another environment or on another account, all that hard work and design that you put in, it comes along and you literally press a button and it's up. Boy, every slide I say is my favorite. This one I might have to hide though. Some people throw rocks. The gorillas, TCO and ROI analysis. First and foremost, if you didn't get it by now, cloud is just not the same. It exposes a lot about how applications work and how secure they are, or their requirements for uh, load at certain times. It's a real big mental preparation. 
this analysis and how much you save or how much you, more expensive it is, has become a very, very religious or political debate. Any point that I can have or you can have or the on-prem versus the cloud person can come up with, there is a counterpoint every single time. We've also got Still, the majority of leaders are very unsure and nervous about it. So they're holding on for dear life or everything that they got in their data center that they just paid 18 million bucks 18 months ago for. You gotta be prepared that it's always gonna be the cloud's fault, always. No matter what, oh, it's an AWS, so is the cloud. So you gotta prepare your team with the tools to help you identify where the problems are. The biggest things that we picked up were being able to understand what happens with a packet from the desktop to whatever server it's getting to. If anything, just for the fact to prove that it got there intact. And when somebody pulls out Wireshark, God forbid, they don't know what the heck's going on. That's last resort, so run for the hills. You gotta get some other tools that are gonna give you that full view of the entire environment end to end. I love when I'm asked, how many servers have you got? All right, the first thing, someone comes with a pencil to figure out what things cost. Well, my answer is, what time of day is it? Because you're not able to calculate how many servers uh, you're gonna need in the cloud. I mean, it's consumption based, especially once you uh, motivate and teach these vendors to come over and show them that it's safe, it's an entirely different ball game. It's really a game of monetizing soft savings. I mean, the availability and the redundancy to be able to scale up and down in an instant. How do you express that in a monetary term? Do you say, I'm gonna buy as many servers as AWS has across the world? You know, you'll be in the middle there somewhere where I, I'm okay with this amount of risk, but there's still some level of risk there. So it's very difficult to monetize them. So the only thing that I could speak to is our experience. And I love to say, because it's true, it's getting cheaper by the day. Every day we run it, it's getting less expensive to run. We've documented now, I'll preface this, when we went live, me and Dr. Rob were terrified. We cranked everything up about 18 fold, you know, 600 servers instead of six, make sure the thing's humming. Um, but from that day of go live to today, we're over 40% reduced in operating costs of that same environment. And when you look at it against what we compared to having to have hosted it ourselves, we're in the 30% range uh, that we're saving annually. The reason this thing is getting cheaper by the day are two. One is that we ourselves are improving our skills. We have folks that are understanding the environment. We are working with AWS every day to understand their budgeting tools, how we can apply savings plans, how we're smart about it, and monitoring it every single day. We get alerts all the time to say, hey, you're gonna spend an extra five cents. Uh, and then we can go and tweak and understand where the anomalies are. And secondly is the maturing vendor partnership. Once you go and you get the vendor comfortable in one, supporting you, and two, understanding that it's okay to not have as much compute and memory at 2 a.m. as you have at 2 p.m., it literally gets cheaper. And then I wrap mine up with this I love this one. See, I love every slide. We're, we are now saving lives and not drives. The infrastructure piece of this whole thing is not sexy. Again, don't get into this, uh, like I said before, to refinance your technical debt. You, you, you're gonna have to have an out-of-box mentality. You're gonna have to tr challenge traditional thinking that this is the way it's been done and it works and our, our patients are gonna live because the server is under my desk, that patient's gonna live. It's baloney. Every single person on our team believes that they're saving lives. And we have a clear example, just last week, uh, all our analyzers in Tufts, uh, our lab analyzers in Tufts emergency department went down, completely out. They were gonna have to close the emergency department of Tufts Medical Center 
probably for six weeks to be able to get a brand new environment up to be able to take all of that information and get it back into the lab system. We had been working on that new environment for some time in, in test and non-prod. Within, oh, I don't know, that may, may have been, within 12 hours from the night before to eight in the morning, we were back up and running, all lab analyzers, ED never had to close. Now you tell me, did we save any lives from being up and open for six weeks? I would say absolutely yes. We're freeing organizations, right? Everybody who's gonna do this, we're gonna stop worrying about the data center. We're gonna stop worrying about drives. We're gonna stop worrying about running out of space or renegotiating our maintenance uh, contract or buying new hardware because the maintenance is three times the price without new hardware. And we're gonna have our most intelligent ninjas that we've cultivated for years and years and have been wanting to do something to change healthcare and we're gonna let them do healthcare things. We're gonna do the stuff that we saw on the stages out there. I mean, that is the real mind-blowing stuff, like genomics, uh, I mean, just addressing quality measures all the way down to the actual individual human. I can't say enough about automation. Automation, automation, and automation is huge. We've put a ton into it, uh, and it's paid off in spades. Um, we had an outage a couple weeks ago. We had no idea we had an outage. The entire core database was out, went down, got brought back up. I think it was 13 seconds. The only reason we knew that we had an outage was because of the automation we put in to tell us. So it's extremely important to have that automation around it. We're democratizing innovation. We're opening up the world of AWS services. This list of services is growing by the day. I don't even know the count anymore now. Is it thousands? Uh, for instance, we've built on top of Epic's mobile app, we're able to supercharge it. We've added multi-language uh, chatbot support. We've created an omni-channel access through this. So what you used to call the digital front door it's no longer a front door. Maybe we call it a digital threshold, I don't know, but we have multiple ways for patients to access us and their caregivers digitally. We use Amazon Connect for our call center, and it's all tied in via APIs to the MyTufts Med app. Uh, if you're, you're in context of a consultation and you're done with the chatting, it will intelligently know who to give you to, whether to escalate it to a different chatbot, whether to escalate it to a human or actual caregiver. It's all wrapped up into one. Uh, a couple diagrams here because they said there'd be some, some techie folks. Uh, we're also beginning to use more advanced um, healthcare level services like Comprehend Medical and the Amazon uh, Health Lake. Uh, in particular, we started a project to help improve the quality in our gastrointestinal reporting without any human intervention. So Comprehend Medical takes uh, all the notes, which is actually dictated, by the way, via Dragon, um, and all this information is stored in HealthLake, and we're able to apply all sorts of AI and ML tools to these things to help improve the interoperability and ultimately the quality that we provide our patients. So we need more brave souls. I mean, there's always a first to do something. And I'm sure 14 months, I was very proud of that. But I want the next one and the next one and the next one to the point where you can go into the store and just say, OK, I want Philips EKG. Here you go, I press it, and boom, it's going to be up for you. We need more of you to take, uh, take the dip with us. We want, we want you to help move the ball down the field instead of what we've traditionally been doing, moving that goalpost back. We've proven the concepts, and the result is freaking awesome. So I thank you for your time, and I'll give you back to Mike. Thank you, Jeremy. I, I always learn something new from you when you talk, so I, I sure appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs>
So we've got a couple of more things here, but before we uh, uh, transition, let's summarize what we've learned today. First, you want to make your EHR elastic by running it on AWS. Second, you want to take your digital health ecosystem to where that new technology already lives and has been proven. This is no longer the art of the possible. Tufts Medicine is doing it today. And they're creating value in health system operations using the AWS cloud so that they can focus on saving lives, not drives. Really like that, by the way. Now, we're doing something, think that I, something that I think you're gonna really like. Uh, within AWS, our focus is always the patient. Uh, AWS and Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C., they partnered to showcase some of the groundbreaking work that Children's National does and how it uses AWS to positively affect the lives of their pediatric patients around the world. Now, within that partnership, we're showcasing child artists who are patients at Children's National. And they're the reasons why this, this intersection of health and technology is vital. And we're thrilled to showcase their artistry. So I encourage you to stop by the AWS Health Lounge and pick up some of these pins like, that I have here. Uh, but go to the Health Lounge to pick up a pin designed by a child artist and hear about the inspiration behind that pin design. Now, while you're at the AWS Health Lounge, our health experts would love to chat with you and demonstrate some of the new additions to the AWS for Health portfolio, such as HealthLake Medical Imaging, which saves 40% on storage costs, and HealthLake Analytics, which delivers one-touch ML coding. If you have any questions, we'll be up front, and feel free, feel free to reach out to us via email. Um, and please complete the session survey. It really helps us determine what works, what doesn't work, and how we can make future sessions better. And thank you so much for spending your valued time with us today.